Okay, here we go. All right, so more black people in the Bible. I'm going to talk about this first. Why talk about black people in the Bible? Here's why. Generally speaking, when people talk about this subject, when, when some people talk about the subject, as I've heard people talk about the subject, they either have it all wrong and they're trying to prove that Ham was cursed. You, you may have never had to sit under any of that goofy teaching. I have, right, in, in so-called Bible colleges. It's fascinating, okay? But we talked about Charles Schofield last week and how that all got purported, okay? Um, um, or people who are making the fact or who, are, who have it right, but they're a little irritated about it. I, like, I'm not irritated about the subject at all. Like, I don't, I don't need to have an attitude about believing. I'm, I'm exactly as God made me for the purpose of my life, right? And I am on assignment. So whether somebody likes that or not, whether they're mad about it or not, I, you know what, I, I can't complain. You're a mud puddle, baby. I, don't, I just can't. I don't like mud. Okay. So, um, so why talk about black people in the Bible? Because one of the things that we as followers of Christ need to do is we need to learn to speak the truth in love. We need to learn how to stop speaking the truth in irritation. We need to learn how to stop speaking the truth in frustration. We need to learn how to stop speaking the truth in anger and indignation and just learn to speak the truth in love. Like, the truth does not need my emotion to make it better. Am, am I talking to anybody in here? Right? Right? If, like, like. Some negative emotion for intensity does not amplify, somehow amplify truth, right? Because the truth, the truth is the truth. Okay, so here we go. Why do I say we need to speak the truth in love? Here's what it says in um, Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 10. It says, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. By the way, a saint is not some person who never sins. Like, like, like I know in Catholicism they have St. Michael and St. Philip and St. Joseph and St. all these people who you go pray to. There's no place in the Bible that teaches that. That's like as unbiblical as, that's a, that's a, a, a different form of idolatry, Okay. When it says saints, the word saint comes from the word sanctified, which comes from the word separate, which means set apart. So a person who is a saint is somebody who has received Christ as the full propitiation for their sin, and they are setting themselves apart for his service. That is a saint. A bibli that's the biblical definition of a saint. Okay, A saint is not somebody who's holy all the time. No, there's somebody who set themselves apart for Christ's purpose for their life. That, that makes you a saint, okay? So, um, um, b -b -b Pastor Jude, for the perfecting of the saints. By the way, that word perfecting doesn't mean making you perfect and without sin. It means maturity. It means completion. It means adulthood of the saints, okay? That's why God gave those gifts to the church. And then it says, um, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, which means the work of the ministry is supposed to be done by the mature saints. It's not supposed to be done by the past apostles and teachers, apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. It's supposed to be done by the mature saints that the pa apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers matured. Are y'all tracking? And they edified. Okay, that's who's like, what does that mean? That means we're all supposed to do the work of the ministry. The word ministry means service. We're all supposed to be looking for people, people to serve and places to serve. That's what we're all here for. I am here to serve you. I am not here to compel you to serve me. You're here to serve. Each, we're all here to serve each other. We're not here to compel each other to serve us. You, know, you want to have a great marriage? Husbands, love and serve your wives. Wives, love and serve your husbands. Don't change the game. Like forever. Okay. Um. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Hmm, the unity of the faith. Hmm, I wonder what the unity of faith is. It probably doesn't look like Baptists over here, Methodists over here, and Episcopalians over here, and, and Lutherans over there, and, and whoever else over yonder. It probably, the unity of faith probably doesn't look like that. I don't know, it's just a guess, right? Um, that we henceforth should be no more children tossed through and to and fro, 
carried about with every wind of doctrine and by the slight of men and the cunning and craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Here's what that means. The Bible talks about like the different parts of us being members. My hands are a member of my body. My elbows are a member of my body. My eyes are a member of my body. My ears are a member. My legs are a member of my body. And they are all supposed to work together to serve the head. Are y'all tracking? And I think I may have said this last week. I, I may not have. But one of the reasons human beings, we use utensils to eat is because we're demonstrating that the lower part of us should serve the highest part of us. It's a picture of sacrifice, right? Eating with a knife and fork is a picture of sacrifice. Animals lower their head to their food. What, what does that mean? They are just what they are, and they are gonna, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna reduce themselves to the lowest aspect of their nature. But we as human beings, we, we lift our food to our mouths, just like our lives are supposed to be lifted up as an offering, as a sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, okay? So, so the reason I'm talking about this is to speak the truth in love. And I love what my daughter says. My daughter, Dee, always says, the truth should never travel without, I mean, the truth should never travel faster than love. Isn't that good? Right? The truth should never travel faster than love. If people know you're right before they know you care, you care they don't care that you're right. Can I get a witness? So the truth should never travel faster than love but let me, let me warn you now for all y'all all y'all people out there just uh, just uh, just god bless him i know he's doing wrong but god bless him. no god don't bless him doing that god bless him to wake up right even though the truth should never travel faster than love love should never travel without the truth it's really interesting so so to speak the truth in love but also to speak the truth in wisdom um what am I talking about? Well, James chapter 3, verses 3. And by the way, I'm, I'm answering the question, why am I even talking about this in the first place? Why am I talking about black people in the Bible? Because the Bible talks about it. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It didn't say, but by all the words. It said every word. So every word is important. Who's tracking? Wave at me, my peeps. Okay, cool. So... Um, James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now, that word conversation doesn't mean conversation like I'm having a conversation with you right now. That literally means way of life, out of good character, out of how you carry yourself. So that, that's, that's, this is old English, right? In old English, the word conversation meant how you carry yourself. Okay, cool. So good conversations, his works with meekness of wisdom, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Okay, so if you have bitterness, if you have bitter envying and strife in your heart. So, I'm going to say this. As a black person whose parents were oppressed, my parents were oppressed, I even had some oppression in my life, okay? Like, I remember like black and white fountains. I remember not being able to go into a gas station in South Carolina and North Carolina and Georgia. But, you know, if you got to go to the bathroom, you just got to stop on the side of the road because black people weren't allowed in the store. We could buy gas there, but we couldn't go inside. Okay? I remember that. Like, that's a part of my life. Okay? I, I, I got a witness in here. Okay? Um, I was born in a segregated hospital. I have a brace on my leg. I've never run anywhere. I say to people, I couldn't run, so I learned how to fight. Right? Okay. So, 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 well, what you gonna do? You can't run from them, right? You, you, might, you might want to start throwing some blows so they'll leave you alone. Okay, anyway. Anyway, I don't, I, I, I don't, I'm a lover now, not a fighter. I mean, I can fight. Let's don't get it twisted. Okay, but I don't want to fight. Okay. So, just in case anybody got it twisted, I didn't want anybody to think there's a soft target up in here. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Just in case. Okay. So, um, um, so I've walked with a brace my whole life. I walk with a limp. Um, when I, at nighttime, when I take my brace off, I have to walk with crutches. Like, 
don't feel sorry for me at all. Like, I don't mean don't feel a little bit, don't feel sorry for me at all. Because I, I can't think of a human being on God's green earth in now or in world history that I want to trade places with. So don't feel bad for me. Okay, I'm all right. Okay. Uh, if I wanted to have a cultural or worldly perspective, I could have bitterness and strife in my heart towards the white establishment, so-called, that created a situation that caused me to have this, this uh, what do they call them, disability. I call it a different ability, but we'll call it a disability. Um, this disability my whole life. I'm 61. I've never walked without a brace. Now, why am I telling you that? Because I don't have any bitterness about it at all. I don't, like, what do you, you don't have a lot? No, I don't have any. Now, when I was a little kid, I had some. I had all kind of attitude, right? Uh, I'd fight at the drop of a hat, and sometimes I'd drop the hat. Okay. I'm just, full transparency. Full transparency. Okay. Just want y'all to know who you're dealing with. I ain't, I ain't been, I got saved when I was 16. I wasn't saved my whole life, okay? Okay, so anyway. But I don't, I don't have any bitterness for this. Why? Because I understand that God is sovereign. And there are people in your life right now, and maybe there are people you don't know, and maybe there are people you know. There are people in your life right now who've affected your life negatively, impacted your life negatively right now who you're angry with. You're bitter about it. You're carrying it because something daddy did, something mama did, something the teacher did, something, something granddaddy did, something grandmama did, something one of your uncles did. Like something somebody did to you. And I, I want to challenge you. Let it go. I don't mean just kind of let it go and act like it never happened. Instead of just trying to get through it for the rest of your life, why don't you get from it what God ordained that you get from it? What does that even mean? Joseph's, like, I've got six brothers. They have not always been good to me. In full disclosure, I've not always been good to them either. When we were growing up, we didn't get along all the time, right? But as adults, we don't always agree, but we always love each other, and we always get along. And Joseph had 10 brothers that were older than him who were conspiring to kill him. Kill him. Now, my brothers have done some stuff, but not, a na not nary one of them ever tried to kill me. Let's, I got a good idea. Let's kill that man. <laughs> Th they've never said that. And then, like, and, then, and then one of them came and said, no, let's don't kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit. Can I ask you a question, genius? What's the difference? Ain't no food in the pit. Ain't no water in the pit. Like, let's just throw him in the pit. Then... They decided, well, let's don't throw him in, let's don't just leave him in the pit. Let's go back and get him out of the pit and let's sell him. But by the time they got back, the, the Midianites had already gotten him. He was gone. Midianites had already gotten him and already sold him into slavery. So now, because his brothers hate him, he's a slave. And then, so they did him wrong. And guess what? Then his boss's wife lied on him, and then he went to prison for a crime he didn't commit. Let it go. When Joseph's brothers after their dad died, thought he was going to get them back, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Do you understand? Another person's evil intention on your life is God's good intention for your life. What? I'm going to tell you right now, if God gave me a do-over, said, man, I'm going to give you a chance to do this thing again. This time you don't have to have polio. You want to do it? Absolutely, positively, unequivocally, no. Not at all. There are things I learned because of my difficulties that I could not have learned without them. I have become a person because of the difficulties I've struggled with that I could not have come without, I could not have become without them. My parents had it hard. My dad had it really hard. My dad's, my dad's dad died when he was nine, and he was, he was passed around on work camps and work farms and whipped on his bare back and, and just, all, just all kinds of crazy. His dad took care of everybody. Like, his dad at one time, I think, had like 20-something people living in their house, according to the census. My dad's dad died, and him and his brother, Uncle Freddie, 
Nobody took care of them, so they got passed around. To, and, and it wasn't like foster care today. It was like work camps. And my dad had a lot of anger because nobody took him in. And so my dad had some issues in the first part of his life with alcohol. I mean, major. And it made our lives hard. And I'm not putting my dad on blast. I, I wouldn't trade dads with anybody in the world. My dad was a great man. My dad was a great man. But he was a great man who was in pain. And sometimes hurt people hurt people. And it was all a trickle effect, trickle down effect of the oppression of black people in the United States of America. But I ain't mad about it. I ain't mad at white vote. Because all of that difficulty made our gene pool stronger. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just telling you, this is a reality. Like, l let go of the narrative that, that because we were done wrong, that makes us victims. I ain't a victim, I ain't, I ain't fixing to be nobody's victim. And by the way, when I, so, I recommended a couple books last week. I recommended The Warmth of Other Sons. It's a painful book. It'll make you cry like, like you can't imagine. Um, and I also mentioned a book called Slavery by Another Name, which is how, through the Jim Crow laws and the convict leasing system, how um, like slavery lasted long after the Emancipation Proclamation in the United States of America. Like a lot of people don't know the history, but it's, they're just historical accounts of stuff that happened. There's no, there's, no, there's no agenda. I'm not recommending you read these books so you can go get mad about it. I'm recommending you read these books so you can have a different appreciation for the fact that, if you're black, for the fact that you're here. And if you're white and you're not a racist, you can have an appreciation for the fact that you didn't get caught up in that evil. Right? There, we have so much to be thankful for. And by the way, all of us, regardless of who we are, where we are, when we are, if there's anything good about any of us at all, it's a gift. It is not because of you, it is in spite of you. And what if we could go through life grateful for every circumstance? So Joseph gets sold into slavery, he goes down to prison, spends time there, and he comes out and God makes him the price, and God makes him the prime minister, and he says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Here's what's fascinating. And I'm going to talk about um, Joseph and his wife and some other black folks in the Bible here in a minute. But I, I want you to understand why I'm talking about it. I'm not talking about this so as black people we can rise up in arms and show people who we are. I don't need to show anybody who I am. God knows who I am and I know who I am. That's enough. And by the way, here's what the scripture says. Hum, this is not just for black people. This is for white people, Asian people, Hispanic people, every, all people. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. I, like, I am not confused. Let's don't be confused. You ain't better than nobody, baby. You ain't worse than nobody either. It's okay. Okay, y'all tracking. All right, so I'm ranting a little bit. I don't know why y'all bring that out of me. <laughs> I got to blame it on somebody. Okay, so um, he says, who is a wise man and do with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation work with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. So if you have bitter envying and strife in your heart, you are lying. About what? You're lying about the fact that you're a victim of whatever happened to you. Because you can't be a victim unless you yield to that. If you look at the fact that God is sovereign, then you can celebrate the fact that God loved you enough to prepare you in this way for your assignment. In what way? Whatever your life circumstances are. What's interesting, the same circumstances that affected Joseph's life also affected his father's life, Jacob's life. And Jacob said, all these things are against me. And Joseph said, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. When Pharaoh asked Joseph how old, I mean Jacob, how old he was, and he told him how old he was, he didn't just tell him his age. He said, um, he said um, many and evil have been the days of my life. Oh, no, few and evil have been the days of my life. And he was like 80-some-odd years old. No, he was 135. He's 135. Few and evil have been the days of my life. Now, that's an interesting perspective. Few and evil, you're the descendant of Abraham? Few and evil, you're the one that received the blessing? Few and evil, your brother sold his birthright to you for a bowl of soup? Few and evil, you had 12 sons? Few and evil, you thought one was dead and found out he was alive? Few and evil have the days of my life been? Really? That's, what am I saying? I'm saying you believing the few, like you can buy into, like you can buy into this idea that your life has been hard unfairly and probably it has. 
but it was to prepare you for the assignment for which God created you in the first place. So you can say, instead of like Jacob said, uh, few and evil have been the days of my life, you can say like Joseph, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. I mean, I don't know which, it just seems like to me, that'd be a much better way to go through life. Just a guess. <laughs> a relatively educated guess. Here we go. The wisdom that, is, uh, he, and by the way, by the way, he says, but if you have bitter and being and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. What wisdom? The wisdom that has bitter envying and strife because of the circumstances of your life descendeth not from above, but it's earthly. That's the world. It's fleshly. That's the flesh. Sensual. That's the flesh. And it's devilish. That's the devil. Do you understand that we have three enemies and none of them have skin on them? Except for us. The only skin that I have, the only person with skin on them is my enemy is this skin I got on me right now. My fleshliness, my fleshly appetite. See, we don't understand how the enemy attacks us. The world attacks us in the arena of our ambitious, our ambitions, our desire to be somebody. That's, that's, that's the, those are the temptations of the world, right? For instance, I had an opportunity um, a couple years ago to speak at a conference. I would have probably made $2 million, which is, you know, ain't Bill Gates' fortune, but he ain't nothing to sneeze at, <laughs> right? And I turned him down. And the reason I turned him down is because of a loyalty that I have to a friend of mine who they were opposing. I'm not doing it. Now, that doesn't make me some noble person. I'm just telling you, like, we have to make sure that ambition does not become our primary driver. All good money ain't good. Mm, I wish I had some help in here. <laughs> All good money ain't good. There's some stuff you can't pay me to do. You ain't going to pay me to go. You can't pay me enough money to go against the principles I believe. Okay, y'all tracking. Okay. For where envying and strife is, so this, oh, I, I was telling you about the, 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 the uh, it's earthly sensual devil. So, so the world attacks us in our ambition. The flesh attacks us in our appetites things we want to experience. And they can be food appetites, they can be sex ap appetites, they can be like uh, um, laziness appetites, but making the flesh king, that's sensual. And then the devil affects us in our attitudes. And the attitude of superiority is the primary satanic attitude, like thinking you're better than somebody else. Okay, y'all tracking. But then it says this. Oh, by the way, uh, wisdom that sent from above, earthly, sensual, devilish, for where envy and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. That's why, like, if I have envy and strife in me, then there's confusion in me. I'm confused. My envy and my strife makes me confused. I don't have any envy. I don't have any strife, so I don't have to be confused. And that's not all. There's every evil work. Ah, I can't afford that. I don't want to have envy and I don't want to have evil and confusion and every evil work in me. So I don't want to have any bitterness and strife in me. I ain't mad at my brother for what he said to me when I was in the seventh grade. I ain't mad at my mom and my daddy because they, no, stop it. I ain't even mad at the white folks at the so-called Bible college that was racist that I went to. I ain't mad at them. They helped me learn what not to believe. It's all good. Sometimes it just doesn't feel that way. Okay. I'll track it. Okay. But the wisdom that is from above, I want you to notice this imperative, is first pure. So the wisdom that's from above is prioritized wisdom. It has an order. What is the order? It's first pure, then, and so this is what, I ain't making this up, it's in uh, James 3.17, the wisdom that's from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then easy to be entreated, then full of mercy and good fruits. Wait a minute. So the wisdom that's from above has to be based on righteousness first. Then it's pure. So getting along is not the top priority. Getting along to go along. So I'm going to agree with you even when I disagree with you because I don't want you to feel bad. You're, 
like, I love you. I love all of you, but your feelings ain't my responsibility. Unless your feelings get hurt because of my bad disposition. If you are offended because of my position, that is your problem. If you are offended because of my disposition, that's my problem. How many of y'all tracking? Okay. So it says it's first pure, then it's peaceable, then it's gentle, then it's easy to be entreated, then it's full of mercy and good fruits. I want you to notice what it says. The wisdom from above is without partiality and without hypocrisy. What's partiality? Like favoritism? I, I, I like these folks better because they're white. I like these folks better because they're black. I like these folks better because they're Spanish. These ones, these ones over here, they're black and I'm black, so I like them better. These ones over here, they're white and I'm white, so I like them better. These ones over here, they're Spanish, I'm Spanish. These ones over here, they're Asian, I'm Asian, so I like them better. Not in the Bible. Now, I can, I can be aware of some things. I was driving down the road, I was talking to my good friend, uh, Kenny Grant, and I just happened to have some money on me, which I don't always have cash on me, right? But that day, I had some cash on me. And I see this dude... This young black man, I say young, younger than me, like, when you get to be my age, everybody's young. <laughs> yeah, he's looking, hey, what's up, young man? How you doing, young lady? Right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so I saw this young black man standing on the corner with a sign, and I didn't even read the sign. I didn't care. I knew he was asking for money. He was asking for help. And I said, hold on a second, Kenny. I got to give this man some money. So, and what I said to him, I still believe is true. I said, I need to give this brother some money because whatever he's struggling with, he's struggling. And I said, when I see a black man or black woman alive in the United States of America, they are already an overcomer. So that's a belief that I have. Now, you may not have that belief. I, I promise you, if you read The Warmth of Other Suns, and, and by the way, that doesn't mean all white people oppress. That's not, that's, not, that's not to say that. I just know, like my parents moved from Florida from Tampa, Florida to Pennsylvania in a time where it was against the law for black people, against the law, the laws of the state of Florida, to move out of Florida unless you had work papers for up north. How are you going to get work papers from up north if you can't get up north to get the work papers? <laughs> See, like, so I, I, like, I had no earthly idea what my parents had to overcome just to stay alive and move from Tampa, Florida to Pennsylvania with me and my older brother, Jeff, two babies, a two-year-old and a less than one-year-old. So like the, the, the appreciation that I have for my parents as I began to understand the history of what they had to go through is far greater than it was when I was in their house and they were saying stuff to me that I could not understand. They were saying stuff to me about white people that I could not understand because we grew up in a white town. I never had any problems with the white folks that I knew of. They may have had something bad to say about me behind my back, but they never said it to my face, so I didn't know. So I'm like, what are you talking I don't see it, right? Okay, I'm, 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 I'm give, giving the whole picture. So, so, so I said, if I see a black person and they're struggling, if I can help them, I'm going to help them. But man, what if they go buy drugs? That, that ain't my responsibility right now. I ain't, I, ain't, I, ain't, I, ain't, I ain't trying to straighten them out, and there's cars behind me. <laughs> they're hungry. By the way, I, give, I don't just give money to black people. I give money to white people. Like, if I see somebody struggling, if I see somebody struggling, I want to help them because they're part of my human family. So I'm not making a case that I gave the man money just because he was black, but that sure made it a whole lot easier and a whole lot more necessary from my perspective because he's still alive. And I might help him make, I might help him catch his next win. Okay. But if I find a human being who's struggling, I can help him. Far be it for me to act like I didn't see him. Jesus told me about that. Okay, anyway, y'all track him. So, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Why don't we all just do that? Why don't we just go sow the fruit of righteousness in peace? Now, uh, so, to speak the truth, why am I talking about this? To speak the truth in love, to speak the truth in wisdom, to speak the truth in the presence of lies. What lies? Because, like, do you understand that in seminaries and Bible colleges, they teach this garbage false satanic doctrine of the curse of Ham and that black people are supposed to be servants. Somebody, somebody asked me a question about, like in the Table of Nations, one of the things it says is about, or when, when, um, when Noah was, uh, in, I think it was in the Table of Nations when it says that Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. What does that mean? I thought, I don't know, that's a really good question. What does it mean? That J oh, by the way, well, I, th I think I'll answer that a little bit later because I want to show you something else. So, um, to speak the truth in the presence of lies. What are lies? That the lie is that the Bible is a white man's book. That's the lie, 
right? The lie is that um, um, that the Bible, the only thing the, the, the Bible says about black people is that, we're, that the Ham was cursed and black people are supposed to be slaves. Well, Ham was never cursed. Go read your Bible. Canaan was cursed. He was one of the four sons of Noah. Okay. And even some of those um, descendants of Canaan showed up in Jesus' genealogy, which you'll see next week when you watch that video. Okay, here we go. So, um, first we're going to look at Genesis 1. We've got to start there. We've got to start in Genesis, right? You, I, we're going to talk about the human race. Let's talk about this. Uh, Genesis chapter numero uno, chapter one, um, verse number 26. It says, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fishes of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that moves that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created him Male and female created he them. Them who? Them man. What is the word for man? Adam. A Aleph Dalad Mem. A D A M. And God blessed them. Now, when you go look at that word blessed, don't take my word for it. The word, like, go look it up for yourself. It says to kneel, to bless, um, as an act of adoration. Um, and it says, so God blessed man. He blessed him and said unto him, be fruitful and multiply. I love the fact that it says that. Why? Because God always gives us the ability before he gives us the assignment. He gives us the capacity before he gives us the command. So if God told you to do something, you know you can do it because he told you to do it. He's not going to tell you to do something. God's not in the habit of frustrating his children. He's not going to tell you to do something you can't do or that you can't at least develop the ability to do. How many of y'all track and wave at me, my peeps? Okay. So God made man in his image. Everybody else came from him. So that's the first place we see it. We see also, um, we see that the Bible talks about, so that's Adam. Um, we see the Bible talks about um, the descendants of Ham in the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 28. And where am I at here? Right there, verse 28. Here's what it says, Job 28. That's not it. I wrote down the wrong verse. 128. Okay, let's let's go look at let's go look at Joseph. Where are these black people in the Bible? Let's go look at Joseph. So Joseph was the son of Jacob. He goes down into Egypt. Somebody tell me where Egypt is. Oh, by the way, don't make the mistake of thinking that all black people that, that all black people are from Africa, right? Like there are black people from all different nations around the world. Like Adam, like if indeed the scientists are right, and in order to be uh, to have melanin in your skin, I mean, in order to have a baby with melanin in its skin, either one of the parents has to have melanin in their skin, right? If that's the case, like not ju not only Africans were black. That's that's a construct, okay? But Africans were black and are black. So, um, and the the Hamitic. The descendants of Ham and the descendants of Sham crossed over a bunch um, in the Bible. So Genesis chapter 41, here's what it says in verse number 45. It says, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephathapaneah. I like Joseph better personally. It's easier to say, okay. And gave him to wife Aseneth, the daughter of Potiphar, Potiphar, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, and Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. So Joseph's wife was an African woman. What? Oh, okay, thank you. Joseph's wife, thank you, Larry. Joseph's wife was an African woman. Why is this important? Because when we look at the tribes of Israel in um, Genesis chapter 48, we're going to see what, G, what um, Jacob said as he blessed, um, as he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. So it says, and Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me in Luz, in um, God Almighty appeared unto me in Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and will make 
thee a multitude of people. I will make thee a multitude of people. This is Jacob, by the way. This is Israel. I will make thee a multitude of people. And I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, we know that their mama is a, an African black woman. We know this. Here's what, here's, what, here's, what, here's what Jacob said. Man, I almost put my eye out with those glasses. Here's what he said. <laughs> and now, that ain't funny, y'all. I only got one left if I put that one out. Okay, so, and now two sons, um, and now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. They were one of the 12 tribes of Judah. So, so when you look at the 12 tribes of Judah, you know you have Simeon, you have Reuben, you have Gad, you have Nathali, um, you have uh, Benjamin. Well, you don't have a tribe of Joseph. You have the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, the half tribe of Ephraim and the half tribe of Manasseh, which were the descendants of Joseph. Their mama was black. So this whole idea, this whole idea that there are no black people in the Bible except for slaves is hideous. Okay, and then Joshua is a descendant from Ephraim and Manasseh. One of Joseph's, Joshua's one of Joseph, he's one of the most mighty warriors in, in Israel's history. So we're going to look at one more thing. We're going to look at somebody um, having a problem with so-called interracial date, date, interracial marriage, interracial. So stupid. There's one race. The human race, interracial marriage. What they mean is marriage from people of different colors or ethnicities. Okay, well, God has something to say about that, too. It's interesting. Um, God talks about a lot of stuff, okay, um, in Numbers chapter 12. And I'm going I'm to end with this one, even though I could do. Um, well, no, I'm not going to end with this. I'm going to end with, I'm gonna end with Amos. So Numbers chapter 12, here's what it says. It says, and Miriam... And Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman that he had married. I didn't put that in there. They said, what you doing marrying this Ethiopian woman, bruh? Okay, all right. Or this is, this is the excuse they used. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by, um, by Moses? Have he not also spoken by us? And the Lord heard it. Be careful what you say, because somebody's listening. And the Lord heard it. And it says, uh, 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 where I lost my place, I got so excited. Uh, <laughs> and the Lord heard it. Verse 3, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and said unto Aaron and to Miriam, Come out, ye three, into the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came before him. So he called all three of them. He said, y'all two, come here. <laughs> I love this. Anyway, this is so good. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, and I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. Then I will make myself known unto him in a vision, I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him, I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in, a dark, not in dark speeches, and in the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. There, wherefore... Then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? He said, why weren't you afraid? You should have been scared to talk, say something bad about Moses. Who he married ain't none of your business. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, my servant Moses, who is faithful in all my house. And with him will I speak. Uh, you should have been afraid to speak against my servant Moses. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud... Uh, departed from the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said, Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, or I beg you, lay not this sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, wherein we have sinned. 
Let not her be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when it cometh out of its mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her if her father had not but spit in her face, would she not have been ashamed seven days? Therefore, let her shut up from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received again. And Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people journeyed to, not till, till Miriam was brought again. And afterwards, the people removed from um, Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Pharaoh. So we see that they had a problem with Moses marrying a black woman, and Miriam's the one that spoke it. She's the one that said it. God cursed her with leprosy, and her skin became white. And leprosy is a, neuro, is a neuro, neuro disease where you can't feel things, and then your skin begins to rot, and you don't even feel it. And it turns your skin white. Now, if it, if it turned her skin white as snow, I don't know what color it was before, but it wasn't white as snow. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny. It, it wasn't. Here's what the scripture says about Moses. Moses, God said when Moses, when God told Moses he was going to show him a sign, he said, put your hand in your bosom. He put his hand in his bosom. He came out. He took it out. It was leprous white as snow. And then it says he put his hand back in. God said, put it back in again. And we took it out. It became as his other hand, which means whatever his other hand was, it wasn't leprous white as snow. Right? So all I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that all, black, all, all the people in the Bible were black. I am saying all the people in the Bible weren't white. And I'm saying, also saying, more important than the black genes that are in people in the Bible is the God gene that's in the people in the Bible. We're all made in the image of God. But black people have been isolated and like singled out as if we are some kind of less than human human. That's why I'm talking about this. I'm not, I don't have any attitude about it. I feel, I feel plenty good, always have. I never looked and said, well, you know what I declare? I'd, I don't even like this old dark skin of mine. I don't know. I, li I like it. And by the way, if it was white, if it was white, I'd like it too. I like it because of what God gave me. Okay, one last verse. Amos 9. This is the last one. Amos, Amos, Amos. Not famous Amos. This is a different Amos. Okay, Amos chapter 9, verse number 7. Here's what it says. Are you not as the children of the Ethiopians, O children of Israel? Saith the Lord, have not I brought you up, Israel, out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines and, Ka and Kaftor and Syrians from Kerr? Here's what we need to understand. Black people, God loves you but he doesn't love you because you're black. <laughs> white folk, God loves you, but he don't love you because you're white. Spanish folk, God loves you, but he don't love you because you're Spanish. Asian folk, God loves you, but he don't love you because you're Asian. Any other folk that I missed out on, if I skipped you, God loves you, but not because of anything on the outside of you, but because of what's on the inside of you. You are made in his image. If you receive Christ, as your savior, you're doubly loved because now you're a child of God. If you yield your life to him, now you're triply loved because now you're a child of God living in the stead of Christ. Let's let that be our primary identifying factor, like James, who's the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though he was the half-brother of Jesus and the senior pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. We think we need all these titles. Dr. Myron Golden, man. I don't even need to be no nurse, y'all. I can just be plain old-fashioned mine. I've been mine my whole life. I'll be mine as when I'm gone. Mine. We, we, oh, this person is that, and that person, this person has money, and this person has that. I made, you know the most valuable thing about me? I am made in the image of God, and I am saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and doing everything in my power to follow him in his word. That's the thing that makes me valuable to God, so that's the thing that makes me valuable to me. I hope this helps you. Stay blessed by the best in the B time, in between time. Peace out, Cub Scouts. We'll see you on the next video.